Hello, this is Positive Tiger Gamer coming back at you with another opinion and answer short. As you clearly heard at the beginning of this recording, we are on our ninth opinion and answer short of our opinion and answer short train series. So, folks, I'm so happy that you're sticking around for it. Um, based on the first eight opinion and answer shorts that I have produced, I have seen there are some amazing views on there, so I'm glad you guys are enjoying them. For our opinion and answer short number nine, as you as I have indicated on my community post tab, with the question of what does the ROD stand for, um, for those of you who have voted, yes, you were correct with the ROD standing for the Railway Operating Division, because um, that is what we're going to be talking about, because Saturday, November 11th is Veterans Day, so I felt the need of... Why don't we dive into some historical want part of my train blog by discussing railroad veteran locomotives in terms of the ROD and the narrow gauge white railways, which if it wasn't for the railways, we wouldn't, the World War I would have a different outcome, folks. So let's dive right into it. So on the first half of this opinion and answer short number nine, we will be focusing on railroad veterans, which is my opinion and answer Part 23 on my Steam Train blog, link in the description. So, folks, let's get right into part one of this short. Um, what does the ROD stand for and the Railway Battalions? Um, the ROD, like I said, stands for the Railway Operations Division, who were charged with operating the railways under the Royal Engineers in the year 1915, during war, World War One. The railway battalions were the battalions made up of railroad workers who had slash trained to operate the ROD steam locomotives during the wartime. Uh, some railway battalions were also charged with building railways and repairing the ROD steam locomotives. Uh, what were their role in World War I? Well, their role involved operating both standard gauge railway and narrow gauge railway, which we will get to in a minute. Um, along with the railway workers in the different war fronts that were fought during war World War One or WW1, whichever we want to look at it, they were charged with supplying both soldiers and equipments, equipment to the different war fronts, along with bringing back the wounded soldiers. As we are cover, as I will cover the ambulance trains in a, in the next opinion and answer short. Um, Railway operations divisions equipment during World War One. During World War One, the ROD order Railway Operations Division was using many diverse steam locomotives from Britain's railway companies and at least several Belgian locomotives sent to France in 1914. As the war kept going on, the ROD adopted the Great Central Railway's Robinson Class 8K280 as its standard freight locomotive to become the ROD280 classification. Even some of the steam locomotives that were used by the ROD were purchased from Baldwin Company in the United States. Along with having... Standard gauge locomotives, they also operated, according to research, operated meter gauge or 600 millimeter 2.0 feet narrow gauge trains um, who assisted the Railway Operations Division with their equipment. Along with the Railway Operations Division, there were at least 42 railway construction companies on top of the two regular and three special reserve companies at the start of World War One who were charged with building standard gauge railways on the war fronts, with the last company being destroyed, or in this case, demolished, um, at the end of World War I in 1919. And as we move out of the war into another peacetime, um, the Railway Operations Division after World War I returned their leased, their leased um, steam locomotives to their foreign country owners and kept both the ROD-280 and the Baldwin locomotives. The ROD-280 were stored in Great Britain and sold to several British companies between 1919 and 1927. Um, and the Baldwin locomotives were sold as military surplus, with most of them ending up in Belgium and France. Um, so basically, during World War I um, in Great Britain, um, the railway um, became uh, came under the control of the British government, who created the Railroad Operations Division within the military, and that... And that concludes part one of th of this opinion and short answer. Uh, number nine, railroad locomotives. On to part two, titled Niagara Gauge Light Railway Heroes. 
Um, if it wasn't for the narrow gauge light railway, we would not have been able to, I guess, win the war from what history has shown us. Um, what were the narrow gauge trench railways? These narrow gauge trench railways were light railways that contributed to the Allied forces, um, which were France, Great Britain, Russia, Italy, Japan, and later the United States. By supplying the war fronts with soldiers and supplies and evacuation of the wounded soldiers to rear protected areas, uh, which were operated under the Railway Operations Division. Uh, why were the narrow gauge tramp railways classified as light railways? Well, the answer to that question is, is these narrow gauge trench railways were light railways because they were built with lightweight materials that were cheap to use and reduced civil engineering costs due to having lower standards than heavy rail. Um, from Wikipedia, I know a lot of people don't trust Wikipedia, but it was the best definition I could try to find. Um, light railways is a railway built at a lower cost and to a lower standards than typical heavy rail. It uses lighter weight track and maybe it may have more steep gradients and tight curves to reduce civil engineering costs. These lighter standards allow lower costs of operation at the price of lower vehicle capacity. Which basically means the fact of as soon as the train passed over them, they could quickly be picked up and moved. Um, how did the narrow gauge trench railways help the Allied forces? Um, like previously mentioned, <clears throat> um, these trench railways helped the Allied forces by supplying the war fronts with soldiers and supplies and evacuation of the wounded soldiers to rear protected areas. Um, the way they would do it was by running back and forth from the war front to a rear protected areas transfer point of a yard or station to meet up with the standard gauge steam, will, steam engines to transfer either supplies and soldiers from standard gauge to in, um, engines to the narrow gauge or wounded soldiers from narrow gauge to standard gauge engines. It was better to go with the narrow gauge approach because they were more of small, they were smaller in design and made it easier for to not be spotted by the enemy um, and keep the standard gauge locomotives who are much larger in the rear to keep them moving um, supplies and stuff around. Um, how they were built and operated? Well, the answer to that, folks, is the fact that they were built by soldiers who quickly assembled prefabricated 5 meter, 16 feet, 5 inches sections of track weighing about 100 kilograms or 220 pounds along with Along roads or over small, smooth terrain, the tracks would distributed heavy loads to minimize development of muddy rust through unpaved services. Then the railway would operate small locomotives that pull short trains of 10, of 10 tons or 22,000 pounds capacity cars through areas of minimum clearance and small radius curves. The only problem was that the derailments were common, but the light rolling stock was relatively easy to rerail. Um, the small steam locomotives typically carried a short length of flexible pipe called a water lifter to refill water tanks from flooded shell holes. And that's it for this opinion and answer short number nine, folks. Uh, thank you for joining us on this historical moment as we look back at World War I and how the railways played a role for the Allied forces. Uh, links will be provided down below for further reading and understanding of the Little Engines heroes of World War I, along with the railroad veterans in, in, uh, in the terms of the Railway Operating Division, along with a link to the Smithsonian Channel's YouTube um, playlist that I have seen on uh, that title, Combat Trains, which I would highly recommend you all go check that out. And that, folks... So, folks, um, that's it for this opinion and answer short number nine, titled Veteran Locomotives, in honor of our brave veterans who served in World War One, along with all the war, along with all the wars, either that they have fought or are currently in. Even though Veterans Day is for all those who have served or have lost their lives, but I extend Veterans Day to those who are currently active in our in our military around the world. So, folks, thank you for joining us as we look back at, at the railways of World War I and how they were used to help the Allies. Um, before we leave, I'm going to actually highlight one more um, from the military. So, please bear with me as I look it up. Uh, basically, in the, in, 
one last part of this, which I would consider actually part three, now that I'm thinking of it, um, are your ambulance trains. Um, folks in the military, these were rare trains that were used during wartime. And that, so please and sit back and also enjoy part three of this opinion and answer short number nine as we examine the ambulance trains. Um, when did ambulance trains do their services? Well, folks, we're going back to the American Civil War in 1861 and lasting until then. And then, so we're going to go examine a few more wars. So, folks, please bear with us. Um, ambulance trains started running. Ambulance trains started running all the way back to the American Civil War in 1861 and lasted to the end of the war in 1865 where they were used where they used makeshift boxcars to haul the sick and injured by relief organizations aka the Red Cross. After 1865 the ambulance trains faded into history and were not seen again until the year 1898 during the Spanish-American War. In the Spanish-American War, a line of Pullman tourist rail cars were used before fading into history once again after the war was over. And were not seen for a long time until the big First World War. Um, the year was 1914. And the ambulance trains were called back into service once again, which led to custom belt and leasing passengers and unit cars being used until the end of WW1 in the year 1918. After World War I was over in 1918, the ambulance trains had faded away for 20 years, not to be used again until 1939, where the world once again went, into, went to war in World War II for six sad years. Um, for six sad years, you, um, 1939 to 1945, there was a long line of ambulance trains going up and down the rails across the world. There are many of the deadliest conflicts. On top of the long ambulance trains, Additional lease sleepers and chair cars were called into service to help with moving the sick and injured soldiers. After 1945, many of the ambulance train cars were faded into history by being converted back into passenger car passengers and dining cars and were sold. Uh, since World War II ending at this time in 1945, ambulance trains were once again not seen for four years until getting the call for the final time, according to my research. To assist in the Korean War during 1950 to 1953, um, the ambulance rail cars were not converted or sold, were sent to Korea with replacements being ordered. After 1953, the ambulance trains replacement cars were either sold, stored, or never used. Um, what war did the ambulance trains do most ser their, their most service for? In my view, I would have to say World War II did see the most use for the ambulance trains, especially on the homeland of Great Britain at the dock of Southampton during World War II. Before World War II, the British government had planned how they were handling the amount of injured soldiers, um, which will be a link in the description or in the top right-hand corner of this for the link for more information on it. Otherwise, besides World War II, I would say World War I um, would be the two biggest um, wars that they've seen their services being used. Um, how many wars were ambulance trains called to serve? According to research, ambulance trains were called to serve in five wars, ranging from the earliest in 1861, start of the American Civil War, to, to the end of the last war they served in in 1953, end of the Korean War. So the American Civil War, the Spanish-American War, World War One, World War Two, and the Korean War. Um, ambulance train sh services, in terms of shortest and second shortest, um, the shortest war to see the use of ambulance trains were the Spanish-American War in 1898. The second shortest war time to see an ambulance to see ambulance trains was the Korean War between 1950 and 1953. Um, basically, one year for the Spanish-American War and three years for the Korean War. Um, and then the longest war service was six years of World War II, with two four-year spans in the American Civil War and again in World War One. Um, hopefully you all enjoyed this mini additional trip um, into history between the wars and ambulance trains. And folks that will actually absolutely do for this ve this veteran railroad um, opinion and answer short number nine as we examine ambulance trains, um, this the ROD and the narrow gauge railways that were all used during wartime efforts. 
Folks, there will be links in the description for you guys to go enjoy for further reading and further understanding. And folks, while you're at it, go check out my Steam Train blog. Uh, link will be in the description for that too. So folks, um, from Positive Tiger Gamer, wishing you all a good positive day, good positive week, and we will see you all on another edition of our Opinion and Answer Short, where we reach the big number 10 in our next short. So folks... Look out for the community post for that because I might need your help. Um, that will do it for this Opinion and Answer short for Monday, November 6th. Uh, this episode will probably be coming out on Tuesday afternoon, November 7th. So, folks, hopefully you enjoy as we dedicated this episode to all of the veterans, both living who have, who have served, um, are living, or have passed away from the wars. My heart goes out to you all, folks. So, folks, this is a dedicated to them. So, folks, Positive Tiger Gamer here, wishing you all a good positive day, good positive week, and we will see you all on another edition, folks. You all have a good one, and we will see you on another edition. Um, 